to do, and that is to defend those God-given inalienable rights that are so delineated. And when we do that, then we maintain freedom. And when we don't do that, we end up turning this experiment in freedom, as William Penn said, on its head. And then we have a real challenge. If you don't mind, I'm going to try and just walk through briefly what I believe to be the challenges that are facing this Commonwealth, give you a little bit of perspective of how I view things to be and how I would project to address those challenges. And I would say that the challenges that are facing this Commonwealth folks tonight are, 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 are unequal. What will face this next governor and the next legislature are unparalleled. And I don't think I'm overstating that. For the sake of ease, I'm going to put them into three categories and say our challenges are in three areas. They are in economic areas, they are in educational areas, and they are in ethical areas. We're challenged in all three. The economic challenges that face this commonwealth are very real. They're in two areas. We have two problem areas. We have business problem areas. And we have budgetary problems. The business problems are the things that we think of when we think of our jobs and the economy. And certainly I can tell you for sure that the economy of this state and our job circumstances have been influenced significantly by policies out of Washington. Certainly things like NAFTA and GATT and environmental policies have made us as a nation uncompetitive with the rest of the world. And we can't deal with those specifically, although I think a governor can deal with them more than you might think. I want to talk about what's here in Pennsylvania. Why is Pennsylvania at the bottom of the stack? If we can't identify our problems, we can't fix them. So I'm going to identify why we are where we are. Why is Pennsylvania the bottom of the stack when it comes to job creation? It's because of this reason. Number one, we have the highest business taxes in the country. Why would anyone want to come to Pennsylvania and pay the highest taxes when it's tough to maintain a profit anyway? You go somewhere else, and they do, and the companies have, and they don't want to come here, so small business or large alike. Now, I think it's interesting to put down because everything has a, have a history. Why does Pennsylvania have the highest business taxes in the country? I'll take you back a few years. 1991, Bob Casey was governor. The legislature faced a $1 billion deficit. The choice, raise taxes or reduce spending? They chose to raise taxes. Because had they reduced spending, we'd be in a whole different ballgame in Pennsylvania right now. But they did. They chose to raise taxes by a billion dollars, but it was an election year. They couldn't buy that. They couldn't get enough votes. And so they bought the votes, and it cost $2 billion to buy the votes. The tax increase in 1991 was $3 billion, and it's been embedded in the budget ever since. The taxes went down almost exclusively on the backs of business, and our rates went up to the top. So we paid very dearly for a lack of discipline then in reducing spending. So can we fix that? Yeah, we can. We really, uh, we can just reduce the, 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 the tax rates by just one or two percent and make ourselves competitive. And the legislature would follow me in doing that, I really believe. The second category is regulatory climate. The regulatory climate is almost as bad or worse than perhaps the tax rates. The regulatory climate is the part that is, if you as a business person seek to go and add on to your, 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 your business, build a building, uh, dig a hole in the ground, or anything of that type, you're going to have to get permission to do that. Well, the climate there in the business, in the regulatory climate now will take and say, if you can wait 90 days, if they can make you wait 90 days, you'll wait 90 days for the permit. I am shocked as I cross the state at how capricious the departments are by raising permit fees for people to get uh, whatever they want for their permits. Um, I was out in the western part of the state last week, a coal company out there getting permits. Generally, he said in the past five years, it was $1,500 per permit. They are now being charged $150,000 per permit. Why do you not think that things are going ahead in Pennsylvania? Now, can that be fixed? The answer is yes, that can be fixed. Why? Because the regulatory climate is not a matter of law. It's an interpretation. It's an attitude. It really is the attitude of the governor that permeates down through the agencies that says that we are either going to work with those who are willing to step up and add on or build or start a business, or we're going to work against them. 
We're either going to put a roadblock in front or we're going to say, no, we're here to help you. How quickly can we get this out? Because we want you to create those jobs. We want to do all that we can. That's an attitude of the governor. And I can say that my attitude, my belief that government does not create jobs, but it sure can prevent an awful lot of jobs from being created, and it can chase them out of the state. My background as a business person, a director of marketing, customer service, I know what needs to be done. It's an attitude. We can change the attitude overnight when elected because I will, oppose, I will, I will appoint people who think like this and understand that is the private sector and it's the small individual job creator that really is the lifeblood of our commonwealth. <laughs> now the third reason why we are not competitive, often not talked about, but I've been talking about it as I'm out because you can't deny it if you're going to be truthful. It's our labor climate in Pennsylvania. Now, I was in a setting in Philadelphia some weeks ago and it was in a very, very liberal setting. Uh, members of ACORN and Planned Parenthood were there as members of the audience and asking the questions. And I said I would go with the Democrat gubernatorial candidates because I would just, I'm going to go because I think conservative ideas actually do prevail. And so I said I'm going to go. So one of, the, one of the guys asked the questions from the union and said, if you're elected, what will you do to ensure collective bargaining project labor agreements and things of that type and the Democrat candidates just fell all over themselves saying absolutely no question about it. And I said let me answer that question differently if I could. And I looked right at that individual asked the question. I said first, first of all I want you to understand that I believe and I'll fight for the right of a private organization called a union to organize in the private sector because I believe they have the right to do so. And I said, lest you think that I'm just anti-union, I'm not. I said, my father was a United Steel worker for 43 years. And so I grew up in a union home. I said, however, there's another aspect of this equation. I said, you as an individual, I believe have the right, the, the, I believe a constitutional right in, in relationship to this, to be able to choose employment, where you choose employment where you are not forced to join and become a member of a private organization called a union as a condition of employment. Yep. The Constitution. I said, now why is this important? Because of this. The Constitution guarantees individual rights. It does not guarantee group rights or organizational rights. And whenever a government enters into an arrangement with a private group, I don't care what, by name, what name you call it, but enter into a private arrangement with a private group that compromises and overrides an individual right, we have trouble. And the economy will not work. And your rights have got to be protected. So I'm going to come down on the side of the employee's rights first. And all these other things can work out. But you know, folks, this reason, because we don't have this law in this state that allows an employee to choose like that, that's the number one reason why we've lost jobs. They've gone down south. So that's the number one reason. So if we're going to deal with, if we're going to talk about fixing our problems and restoring our economy, you've got to put everything on the table. And these are it. And these are how we can fix these. Now, the one beautiful thing about us in Pennsylvania is that we have an opportunity to have to develop a brand new industry, perhaps the largest one that this state has seen. And it's based on a natural resource we have under the ground in the Commonwealth. And it's in the field of energy. And it's called natural gas. We have in the form of Marcellus Shale natural gas in Pennsylvania, we have more clean energy than any state in the nation. Matter of fact, with a new, more recently developed and found, discovered, second layer of shale, we have double the amount of expected gas underneath the ground in Pennsylvania, and it's now being talked about maybe having more than any nation in the world when you couple it together with our coal that's underground. Do you realize what we have here? We have here a natural resource. A resource is to be used. 
It's natural, meaning it was God-given. So we have a God-given natural resource that has the ability here to set this state above all other states. We can 